Um, our host, Emily Bloom, is having some connectivity problems, and so hopefully will be joining us shortly. Um, but I thought we could kick off by um, just talking a little bit about why we wrote these books. So Carrie, would you like to start? Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, New York time. Uh, I'm Carrie Walsh at Fordham University. And the book that I'm talking about today, um, can everyone hear me, by the way? Yes. Okay. The book that I'm talking about today is an edition, an Oxford World Classics edition of James Joyce's play, Exiles. And the reason I worked on this um, was that before this, I had edited Dubliners and the Letters <coughs> of Sylvia Beach. So I was kind of on a roll as a Joyce World editor. And I really, as a theater person, also just wanted to, to return to this play of Joyce's that has such a strange status. And to look at it, but in a slightly different way. When I work on women playwrights, like say I'm interested in Kate O'Brien's plays, I always have a feeling that I'm doing some kind of reclamation work where I have to show that the play is as good as any play written by a male playwright. And there's a kind of moral imperative and a feminist imperative. And I didn't feel that same feeling in editing Joyce's Exiles. And it was actually kind of refreshing to be able to go and look at something that has a strange status a kind of lost or neglected status, but not necessarily feel that I had to reclaim it as a great play or that good, whether it was a good or bad play didn't matter that much. It was by Joyce and, you know, it was worth reading. And then I could just try to understand it and not have to reclaim it. And I think um, just to say one final thing about what drew me to it is I think the a certain radical potential in the way that Joyce depicts perhaps an incommensurability between the male and female characters, uh, a sort of less feel-good portrait than you might get in Ulysses or elsewhere about whether men and women can satisfy each other or how they will be together. So I truly enjoyed working on it um, because of that. But I also just should mention, it was a very strange editing experience because Exiles is a very transparent play. That is to say, there aren't a lot of the kind of hermeneutic difficulties that you would usually have in Joyce. Footnotes about like Catholic church history or anything. There was so little to footnote that it was almost concerning for me. Uh, and so I had to find the, the, I eventually found that the hermeneutic difficulty lay somewhere else in like what the tone of the play is and what its relationship is to its theatrical predecessors, but not in the kind of illusion chasing that we're used to in Joyce. So in many ways, it was a really fascinating experience and I'm so glad I did it. Elizabeth, that recovery work is a large part, really, is the crux of the book that you've just published. Many congratulations to you as well. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about how you came into that project? Thank you so much, Lauren, and thanks everyone for being here. So nice to see family and um, colleagues and readers, people who've read much of the work that I've produced. Um, and a lot of people on this call have helped me by just talking about this over the years. But one way that I got into this was by reading the Abbey actress Sarah Allgood's memoirs in the Berg. And towards the beginning, she says, um, place of honor to the poets, but I would like to have credit given to the actresses, the charwomen, the ushers. So she has this broad idea of who's responsible for a theater. Um, at one point she says the cabbages and kings of um, a theater project. And that's, I saw that throughout her memoirs. Um, and then I started to look at other Abbey Theater actress memoirs, letters. And then there were also clues in the work of Yates and Singh. I mean, Many of us were frustrated when we first read Singh's preface, where he says, I got most of the language from listening to servant girls in the kitchen. And at first it's frustrating, but I think he was also trying to signal. Um, and so I was trying to pick up those signals. Yates also, like he, I was just looking up, he writes in the, the dedication to the Countess Kathleen. I dedicate this play to my friend, Miss Maud Gunn at whose suggestion it was planned and begun some years ago. And you know, that use of the passive, vo passive voice, like it was begun. Well, who began it? Who helped him write it? So I started noticing all these clues in his Nobel Prize speech. 
Yates thanks the All Good Sisters in this way where it's very clear once you start connecting the dots um, that he's, he himself saw them as responsible for some of these plays. So it was just like a shift in perspective, again, helped by the work of many of the people on this call who, whose work I've read over the years. Um, and then once I shifted that perspective and also started to rethink the difference between text and performance and who gets credit and why um, having something written down is itself a mark of privilege is, and also what gets uh, saved. So I'll talk about that later, but what gets saved over the decades is important to this too. My project also involved a lot of rethinking. Um, it started with what seemed like quite innocent question that was asked me, which is, do you think that there is an afterlife to James Loganbach's book, Stone Cottage? Which for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a, a classic work in modernist studies that looks at the relationship that Pound and Yates had when they were working together in this sort of small cottage um, in Ashdown Forest in Sussex um, during the early years of the First World War. And um, the person followed up with, what about Rapallo? They were living together um, near one another again in Rapallo. Um, do you think that there's a book in that? Sure, there's always, there's always a book. So I started thinking about Dates and Pound's friendship in the 30s, particularly in dialogue with Loggenbach's work. But it soon became clear to me that all these other characters kept intruding on what I thought should be the structure of the book. Really interesting figures that were coming in and out of Rapallo, like Richard Aldington, Thomas McGreevy, and that they were having um, collaborative relationships with Yates and Pound that started in Rapallo or were consolidated in Rapallo and then had an afterlife because they continued in correspondence um, after the characters had left um, or in the work itself. And so I started teasing out some of those influences. But there are also some figures that made themselves uh, clear in the archive that weren't very visible in Rapallo itself. And one of those figures was Bridget Patmore, um, who was Aldington's partner at the time. And she writes in her diary, which I consulted in the Harry Ransom Center, about um, how she's never able to get on with her own work because she's always reading Richard's work and giving him feedback. And it was ironic to me this in the archive because this one moment that she has to, to write herself in her diary and have some of her own space, she's writing about Richard and Richard's work and how it's taking over her life. So I set out two in this book thinking about the way that these women in Rapallo have been overlooked and how vital they were, not just to the collaborations, kind of the output, the literary output of the men that were there, but how vital their responses were to understanding what was happening in Italy in the 30s. So that became a big project for me. And of course, Carrie and Elizabeth, you also focus very strongly on Elizabeth most readily, but also carry on these um, women uh, literary figures. Carrie, do, would you like to talk about uh, women in exiles? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm so excited because even though Emily Bloom, our host, has not, I think, managed to enter the Zoom, she left us with some really good questions. And we had a sort of advanced conversation about what we wanted to talk about in this event. And there was so much energy around the idea of investigating, first of all, the concept of collaboration, both in its sort of um, harmonious and wonderful dimensions and in its sort of nefarious ones. And specifically, we got very excited about a conversation about the nature of the muse, the figure of the muse, uh, which was a point of connection, obviously, between all of our books. And so I just thought for a moment, I might lay out in Exiles, um, if you have not read Joyce's Exiles or if you haven't read it for a while, it is about a male artist named Richard, who has for a decade written letters to a woman named Beatrice, a highly freighted <laughs> name in the history of muses. Uh, and she's back in Dublin and she's a music teacher. And he has based all of his writing on her and been in this intellectual muse-like relationship with her. 
And at the same time, he has a common law partner, Bertha, who is sort of modeled on Nora Barnacle, and they have a child together. And so he's, he's sort of divided his affections between the kind of ethereal muse and the, the embodied woman. And he comes back to Dublin and re-encounters the muse and finds that she has just survived an illness. She's, she's a piano teacher, but in a kind of way that is presented as a kind of pedestrian rather than great artistry. And she, she wears glasses and Joyce says it will, in his notes on the play, it will be hard for characters or for audiences to sympathize with Beatrice, but a note of pity can be sounded when she takes out her spectacles and puts them on. So this, this muse figure is like this poor woman who, you know, she has become a spinster because 10 years ago, she did not take Richard's invitation to elope to the continent with him. Uh, she's now back in Dublin teaching piano, like librarian type. And I think as uh, you know there's definitely something in Joyce's depiction of Beatrice that is ungenerous about about what it means to be a woman who's not married and who has a professional career but at the same time I do think in the play there's a critical investigation of the concept of the muse and it comes I believe out of Joyce's obsession with Ibsen's play When We Dead Awaken uh, a play in which a sculptor named Rubik re-encounters his muse uh, from his youth and she tells him, you were like an artistic vampire sucking my young life. <laughs> and I just loved that play. That was the play that he reviewed for his first major literary um, essay. And I think that he's returning to Ibsen and he is critically investigating the dynamic of the muse when he is saying things like uh, suggesting that Richard is the one who has been toxically obsessed with the muse rather than what Ibsen suggests which is that it's the muse who can't get over it the muse who has uh come back to stalk the artist it's the other way around in Joyce so I see there some potential that Joyce is really thinking about this and trying not to be the artistic vampire who just sucks women dry <laughs> uh and Elizabeth this feels like a natural place for you to come in <laughs> um I'm Thanks. gonna jump in as well oh, go ahead Molly yeah sorry I mean, Sorry. Emily, I was thinking, I was thinking about Molly Bloom. Molly so Bloom. I get that, I get that all the time. And I just want to apologize to everyone. Um, after, you know, years of pandemic transatlantic events, I still managed to put 3 p.m. Eastern time in my calendar rather than 10 a.m. Eastern time. So I apologize to everyone for being so late. Um, but it, my excitement about these books is undiminished. Um, and I'm going to, to jump in and um, pick up the question uh, that Carrie was starting to ask to Elizabeth, um, because one thing that when we got together and talked about these books that came up was this idea of how each of your books sort of reinvents this concept of the muse. And Elizabeth, your book, I think in particular, really champions these women who often are described as muses, but that you show have this powerful um, collaborative role in the authorial process. So I'll, I'll go ahead and kick things over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I kind of started to show up at nine, so I, I get it. Um, well, so as many of you know, and Yates met Maud Gunn and said, the troubling of my life began and created out of this vision of her, um, this inspired by Dante and Beatrice, inspired by Helen, he tried to kind of put his idea of her in this legacy of men writing for these unattainable women, okay? And my book argues that Maud Gunn, in fact, not only was part of the creation of Kathleen Houlihan, the play that she made famous in her performance in 1902, and that she saw, she thought she owned, like in the letters after that performance, she's constantly saying to him like, so I'm gonna have this performed in this place and I am not gonna give you money for it. And um, I, I'm gonna perform it this way because this is the way it works better. Even in the production, leading up to the production, she would write him these letters. And Maud Gunn, you know, there's a class part of this because Maud Gunn was from the aristocracy, had um, wealth at her disposal. And so she writes him these letters that say things like, um, I'm going to allow this person to play this part. I'm going to change the ending in this way. Not even asking. You know, she didn't do a lot of asking. She also 
performed, and I think performativity in the activist realm has gotten, become neg had negative com connotations, but I actually applaud her for this. She, during evictions, she put this gorgeous six foot tall, you know, body of hers that she would dress in these incredible dresses and stand in doorways when people were getting evicted. So she, I think, saw herself not so much as a muse, but as someone who was act physically active in politics and physically active in her performances. Um, I think what's interesting is she also did kind of use you know, that fame that she got from being Yates' This thing is making, reminding um, me of all these other places. Her own um, efforts to further her political um, activism. And so she, the tension around Kathleen Houlihan for her and Yates is um, that she saw Kathleen Houlihan as an extension of her tableau work, or, which is when she and Anini Nahar and the Daughters of Ireland, uh, with many Abbey actresses, would perform tableaus of moments in Irish history um, and try to stop people from being recruited to the British Army. Um, I was reading recently that they gave out pamphlets educating people about avoiding sexually transmitted diseases. So they were on, on the front lines. None of those are actions that I think we imagine Amuse taking. So she definitely challenged that. And just one other quick thing, there's some interesting letters to the editor after Molly Allgood plays in the incendiary um, Playboy of the Western World, where people write to Dublin newspapers and say, I felt so sorry for this girl having to say these terrible words uh, that, that Singh wrote. And I'm looking at it thinking, she, she helped write this character. She helped create this character. She's not this passive, poor young girl who's being asked to perform. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a partial answer. But yeah, the, the Yates wanted these muses. But then I also think it's interesting that he chose women who would challenge him. He could have chosen women who would just be beautiful and do what he said, but he chose these women. And then out of that friction, out of that quarrel came uh, these roles and similar with Singh. Although I, I will say Singh wasn't as involved in the muse project. His project was more pushing back against what he called the saga people. So he wanted what he called more brutal female characters, um, but thanks. That's great. Um, so one thing that comes out so strongly in your book is this idea of you know collaboration and how incredibly collaborative these dramatic spaces were, and how you know what a collaborative relationship, especially these actresses and and co-writers had with each other. Um, and so that sort of led me to think about Lauren's book, where I think collaboration has a really different valence, um, where collaboration, um, we think of more in terms of the idea, sort of in the World War II sense, right, as a collaborators, uh, people who work together, but also people who are complicit, um, people who are complicit with political forces, um, particularly Mussolini's um, Italy. Um, so the way that I think in Lauren's book, you really get a sense of collaboration shading into something much darker. Um, so I was wondering, Lauren, if you can talk a little bit about this in your book um, and discuss, discuss the degree to which the poets in Rapallo were complicit with Italian fascism. Um, Thank you, Emily. I think that um, those very positive and very negative definitions of collaboration have actually been one of the impediments really to understanding what was happening in Rapallo in the 30s, because Yates, to take a figurehead, um, Yates's relationship to Pound and to Italian fascism was very oblique um, and was not, um, a process of kind of direct collaboration in the way that we understand it in terms of European fascism um, in the 30s and 40s. Um, so one of the challenges I set myself was really to understand how collaboration was happening in a literary way and how those literary collaborations were interacting with the forces in the regime. So one of the figures that came to the fore there is Basil Bunting who most people know for his very positive politics. You know, he's a conscientious objector in the First World War. He goes on to be very vocally left-wing um, in the mid-century, advocate and, and onward, um, advocates you know, democratic poetics. Um, and he's in Rapallo. Um, what do we make of that? 
I started looking at Bunting's relationship with Pound and critiquing Bunting's involvement in um, literary supplement that was published as part of the, um, the local newspaper in Rapallo. Um, that supplement was itself funded, of course, um, by the regime, and Bunting was involved in concerts that were performed in Rapallo, which were organized by Pound and Olga Rudge in order to celebrate um, culture in a way that was being defined by the regime. Um, so I had to start thinking about not just what Bunting did, but what Bunting didn't do. And that's when we get to that like, difficult question of complicity. And one of the things that he didn't do was speak out um, when uh, very um, obviously fascist sentiments about literature and the arts were uh, put forward in El Mare, the literary supplement. Bunting was often quiet about those, even when he responded to fellow contributors on in, in terms of the aesthetic points that were, they were making, so that he actively omits to address those right-wing political points, but is in discourse with the aesthetic values, really shows the degree to which he was complicit. Um, more of an Irish studies frame, um, I also started thinking about how, hmm, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a complicity, it is, it's more like a fertilization that happens um, between uh, the fascist regime and the work that um, Yates is doing and the way that the culture he sees manifesting around him in Italy, such as the architectural recovery projects that are a major part of the regime's work in a material sense, are making Yeats think about um, an Irish context and the value that 18th century architecture has in Ireland as being on par with the Roman architecture that's being dug up, um, literally dug up in Italy as an example of a noble past that can be recovered, um, that contemporary citizens can identify with as a model for the nation state that they're uh, striving to create in that moment. And so it's very, um, it's, it's very oblique, but by doing the close textual work as understanding the way yeah, it's just like physically moving um, in Italy at the time and the conversations that are happening around him, I was able to make those connections. That's great. That's really wonderful. Um, so uh, the, the question of sort of complicity and um, led me also to think a little bit about uh, Stephen Dedalus and his uh, famous renunciation of various nets, nationality, language, and religion. And uh, this is a question for Carrie. In Exiles, the Stephen figure is Richard Rowan, and he's now a grown man who has temporarily returned uh, to Ireland from his flight from all of the nets um, in Rome. And I would just want to know, Carrie, just a little bit from your very, very intricate reading of Exiles, um, what does freedom mean to Richard? And how is it different from maybe how he imagines freedom for his wife? Thank you so much, Emily. So I think first I'll talk a little bit about how Exiles is the narrative of a return home. So in some ways it is the reverse portrait of the artist because in Portrait Stephen Flees, in Exiles Richard Rowan returns in the summer of 1912 during the home rule crisis. So during a moment where there is a lot of hope for uh, a devolved sort of assembly and a a, a kind of Parnellian solution to the Irish um, problem. And so he is coming back and thinking that he's going to be greeted as a returning champion, a Catholic educated intellectual. There's going to be a place for him in this new Ireland. And finally, it will be a fair one. And it's part of, I think, Joyce's often, uh, he often practices, he does this in Dubliners, a kind of alternate realities kind of thing where he sketches out lives that that were not the ones he ended up living. And as we know, every time he came back to Dublin, he just felt kicked around and abandoned and betrayed <laughs> on so many fronts. And so this is this is an attempt to imagine what it might be like to come back and 
be in Ireland and be respected and have career advancement, become a professor, all of these kinds of things. And there's a counterforce in the text, which is the character of Robert, who with Richard, they have a lot of conversations about what this Ireland of the future is going to look like. And they think a lot about how European it's going to be. And so I think that this play really sort of anticipates the kind of Irish presence in the EU and commitment to the EU that as a kind of future, um, one which avoids both um, colonization, but also becoming settler colonizers by going to the United States or Canada or Australia or Argentina. So this European future um, is one that that Richard and um, Robert really believe in. And they talk about how the future of Ireland belongs to the man who drinks black coffee, so that they should all become European. And that there's some sort of joke too, that that's how the sexual relationship should become, that um, that the men and women should have European arrangements, menage à trois and polyamory. And, you know, even if these things aren't actually true of Europe, they're kind of, there's kind of this sense that these are European ways of thinking about sex. And um, the two male characters have sort of different approaches to this se sexual ethics, where Robert is more of a, a sort of cad or libertine, and Richard, the kind of Joyce figure, is much more uh, ethical polyamorist. Like he, he believes that they should tell each other everything and then it will be okay. And interestingly, at the end of the play, Bertha, the Nora Barnacle figure, uh, asserts that, you know, she doesn't want that kind of freedom. Uh, she doesn't want the freedom her husband is pushing her to, to have sex with his friends, <laughs> you know, or just have that kind of ethical polyamory. But she actually wants something that she frames as a kind of Irish. Uh, so there's like the sort of, there's sex as colonization, the way when, when Richard says early in the play, uh, a kiss is an act of union between a man and a woman. There's sex as European experimentation. And then there's this third thing that Bertha presents at the end of the play, which is just come back to me and love me. And we will do this ourselves in a kind of echo of Irish Republican language. So there is there are sort of these three um, models and the, the freedom that that is asserted at the end is sort of the freedom to to love in a more maybe holistic and organic way that it will be tied to the Irish future uh, that Richard is hoping for. So that's that's something that Bertha has to educate him in uh, a kind of uh, way of understanding that his idea of freedom is not the same as hers, and that obviously has political corollaries. So that quote, um, I'm going to butcher it, but the the future the future man of Ireland the future of Ireland belongs to the man who drinks black coffee. Is that it, yeah. Karen? Yes, <laughs> as opposed to tea. <laughs> right, right. No, that's that's brilliant. Um, and so that. That, of course, makes me think about the cosmopolitanism that I think is a part of all three of these books, um, the way that Ireland interacts with the world, with international contexts. Um, and I think especially in the three books that we're talking about today, it's, it's very much a European context, right? It's really understanding Irish literature as part of European literature. Um, and so I, I want to kind of hear you guys tease that out a little bit more. Um, so is, is that a political choice in this current moment? Um, what do we gain by treating Irish literature as part of European literature? Um, and does is the future of Irish studies with the man who drinks black coffee, I guess, is the, the way to ask that question. I think one of the things that we have to put on the table is how Ireland and Europe has been cast in a particular way in the wake of Brexit, which is a very positive frame, but Carrie is hinting at how we can challenge that by thinking about you know, Europe itself as a colonial actor in our um, contemporary moment and also thinking about, of course, we often talk about you know, the problems with Irish neutrality and the emergency, but I think with that we can go a lot further in terms of thinking about Irish um, involvement or participation in um, the less positive aspects of Europe. Great, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, so, I mean, what's interesting to me about 
these actresses and their Irish identities or not. So for example, um, one of the actresses I focus on, Florence Dara. Yates brought her in to play his Deirdre and just told everyone she was Irish. And I found no definite, I've found no proof that she was Irish. No one has found any proof that she was Irish. Um, there were some class issues there because part of the reason he kept bringing in these women to play Deirdre is that they, he, Yates himself had trouble seeing Catholic working class women like the All Good Sisters in the role of Deirdre. Um, the other piece of this is that Sarah Allgood moved to California. I'm looking at my aunt who's in California right now um, and was in Hollywood and played over 50 contract parts for 20th Century Fox where she was predominantly kind of this exported Irishness where she played the maid, the charwoman, the landlady. So my epilogue deals with that. And she became an American citizen, had a maid herself, and is buried in California. So is she, I mean, she was she was so identified with a certain kind of rural Irishness. Meanwhile, she grew up in Dublin. She spent years of her life in Australia on tour. That's where she lost her husband and her child to the Spanish influenza. So she led this very cosmopolitan life, um, despite what you wouldn't know from watching her roles. Molly Allgood, um, died in London in, and I just have to say, because I always feel like I have to say this when I, when I talk about this book, it matters who gets credit because it affects people's lives. We know this. Yates and Singh, Singh died young, but they died in physical comfort. Um, Molly Allgood, it's, it's hard to talk about, but she, she fell into a fire and, you know, this was partly due to her poverty. Um, once she became so, of an age where she was only in her 50s, but she could no longer play these ingenue parts. Um, Mrs. Patrick Campbell, who's British, but she, she revolutionized Yeats's dear dress. That's another kind of cosmopolitan part of my book is she wasn't, she wasn't um, Irish. She died in 1939 in France, trying to get back to Britain, you know, during that difficult time. And she refused to sell her letters with George Bernard Shaw, she helped create Eliza Doolittle, which I don't, I don't get into in my book, except just to mention that. And, you know, she could have sold the, the letters and gotten back to Britain. She also had a dog that she couldn't travel with. So there were those issues too, but most of this had to do with poverty. Um, so it's, it's troubling because, you know, if these women had gotten the credit that, that I wish they had gotten in their lifetimes, you know, they wouldn't have been dying in poverty. So they were, they, they traveled a lot of times out of financial necessity, but um, it's very fraught, this whole question of Sarah Allgood and Irishness. And, you know, it's kind of the mirror image of Maud Gunn and the whole question of her Irishness. Um, was she, she identified as Irish, she died in Ireland. She was of a British background. Her father was a British officer. So it's all much more complicated. And I'm so grateful for, you three to get me to start thinking about this more. Um, but yes, yeah, Sarah Allgood died an American citizen. Wow, that's, and that's fascinating glimpse into how, you know, the end of all these women's lives too. Um, so thank you for that. So I'm going to open things up to questions, um, but I will belatedly tell you a little bit about our speakers because I was supposed to do that in the beginning. And I think most of you know who they are. They need very little introduction. Um, but before we open things up to questions, I just wanna make sure I have given a little bit of an introduction to our, our three wonderful speakers and their books are amazing. I mean, even if you've read Exiles again, you have to read Carrie's introduction. Uh, the Poets of Rapallo opens up just incredible new ways of thinking about these writers and their connections. And um, Elizabeth's book is just um, uh, really has me entirely rethinking Abbey Theater authorship. So um, I want to thank all three of you for these just really incredible books. Um, so just so you all know, Lauren Arrington is a professor of English at Maynooth University, where she serves as head of department. Um, she has published many, many books, and I, I just will sort of give you a, a, just a, a quick little glimpse. She's published one of the, the most credible books on Constance Markovitz um, and her, his circle, a book also on Abbey Theater um, and censorship, and her new book, The Poets of Rapallo, How Mussolini's Italy Shaped British, Irish, and U.S. Writers, is the one that we're discussing today from Oxford University Press. Incredible. Please go read it.
Um, our next speaker who you've been hearing from so far is Elizabeth Brewer Redwine. She's a lecturer in the English department at Seton Hall University, where she directs the first year course in the university core. In May, she just published this book, so it's very new, um, published Gender, Performance, and Authorship at the Abbey Theater with Oxford University Press, and her co-edited volume, Tagore and Yates, A Postcolonial Re-Envisioning with Amrita Ghosh, comes out with um, Brill Cross Cultural Studies this fall. Um, she also edits with Martha Carpenter, the online journal Critical Inquiries into Irish Studies. And finally, we have Carrie Walsh, who is Director of the Institute of Irish Studies and Associate Professor of English at Fordham University in New York. She is the editor of James Joyce's Exiles for the Oxford Cla World Classic series, James Joyce's Dubliners, and the Letters of Sylvia Beach, as well as the author of Women, Method Acting, and the Hollywood Film. And I'd love to talk more about actresses at some point, because that's another interesting cross point between Elizabeth and Carrie's work. Um, and she recently has taken on co-editorship of Joyce Studies Annual. So on that note, I will open things up to questions from the audience. Um, if you have questions, uh, you know, this is a meeting, so it's open, so you can go ahead and talk, but I would like it if you don't mind raising your hands or putting something in the, the chat and we can kind of go through in a procedural manner. So if you have a question, go ahead and, and raise your hands. Um, and I feel very teacherly, um, but as we're waiting for those hands to come up, um, I have here um, a comment. Um, Patrick O'Sullivan, I don't know if you want to read your comment or if everyone wants to, um, but Eileen Nihulin said the Irish studies was invented in the Bronx in 1926 by Joseph Campbell at Fordham. So Fordham connection, I've never heard that before. That's fascinating. As a foundation myth, it is a good one. Irish studies handy for the Bronx and for Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Do I have any other uh, comments or questions? Carrie, I see he, we've got a, a Fordham, Fordham lineage for you. Okay. Well, if no one has any questions right now, I'm gonna jump the queue and keep asking my questions because I have many, uh, many more. And one of the questions that I just hinted at a moment ago was this, this issue of actresses. Um, there, you know, it really, Elizabeth, your book really got me thinking about the role of actresses in a way that I, I hadn't thought about before, um, thinking about actresses in terms of authorship and the way that their particular contributions might be underestimated, underplayed historically. Um, and actually, Carrie, it had me thinking about your, your new book um, and thinking about, um, thinking about method acting and the actresses in that tradition and the way that they've been kind of um, neglected or undervalued. So um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you wanna start by thinking about how your project has you rethinking the role of the actress in, in literary history in particular. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's interesting, like part of the reason that the All Good Sisters are actresses and not authors is that they spent time in orphanages, even though only one of their parents had died just because financially things were so desperate that one of them had to go to an orphanage, perhaps both. They had to work during the day and then go to Anina Heron and acting at night. Um, you know, they just, they, they didn't have access to the same education and time. You know, we all think of A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf or Shakespeare's sister. And it's incredible that they were able to succeed and get to the Abbey. And I mean, like, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and the Abbey was, was kind of their education. And there's a great story of their mother, Mrs. Allgood, who was a widow and had eight children, approaching Lady Gregory and saying, like, I'm nervous about my young teenage girls becoming part of this Abbey Theater. And at that time, it was scandalous to be an actress. And Lady Gregory says, you know, I'll look after them. And she did. And when there was flirtation, Lady, you know, Sarah Allgood um, records that Lady Gregory would tell them, like, okay, you know, behave appropriately, basically. So I love imagining that. But you know, this, this, the, the way that we record and imagine authorship, I think we've really been trained, myself included, to see authorship as written, and to see, and because we see it as written, who gets to write at that time? Anglo-Irish men. 
that's really just, I mean, Lady Gregory was an anomaly and her case is fascinating. And for those who aren't aware, Lucy McDermott is on this call and, and James Pethka and others have proven how she contributed her words. And she also performed. And that's the other thing is, I think we have kind of a false line between performance and text. And I think there's a way to think about Yeats's, you know, rallying at the stage and some of his angry comments as and definitely the way he dressed as performance as well. So I think many of us, including myself, have been conditioned over the years, just it's in the air we breathe to think of women as performing and men as writing. Obviously this has changed when we look back in the past. And so part of the reason I wanted to kind of trouble that connection between blur that line between, especially in the theater, the actress and the writer um, was to try to recover their voices um, after after all this time. And Sarah Albert's also a writer. You know, she wrote her memoirs, so it's it's much fuzzier and less clean who wrote wrote and created these plays than I think um, I had originally thought. Before we go to Carrie, who's written so amazingly about women method acting and film, I would just like to. Um, Following what Elizabeth is saying, I think George Yates is a major figure here because of her role as translator. So she's often seen as enabler or co-author, which is how um, Meg Harper has written about her in terms of the vision and um, wisdom of two. Um, in the Rapallo period, especially when Yates is particularly ill, George plays the key role of translator. So she's fluent in um, French, German, Italian, and she reads and actively translates these to Yates, who is famously not a linguist. And so she is a medium and author in a different sense in that role of making a whole body of knowledge accessible to him that otherwise would not have informed the work that he was doing. I would love to jump in and, and say, Lauren, yeah, that draws our attention to the fact that actresses are one of a range of these figures in film studies, the, the female editor, the film editor, or lady cutter, as she was called, that there are all kinds of these positions, not just uh, stage performers, who are opening up and making available all kinds of resources to these male artists, <laughs> and translation is certainly one. And Elizabeth, I just wanted to ask you something that might require me to just say, say a little something about my book on method acting. So in, in my book on method acting in the Hollywood film, I, I attempted to overturn a fairly entrenched consensus that method acting was terrible for women. You know, there's a very strong feeling that like, you know, Brando and De Niro, it's like a totally male tradition and it just pushes women to the side. And it was really actually a struggle to write this book because I felt like I was going up against something so, so strongly entrenched. And what I ended up doing was making an argument that actresses like Jane Fonda, uh, Kim Hunter, Julie Harris, and others had used the method to actually empower themselves as authors because of what the method was, not necessarily because this particular theater world was any less sexist than any other, but because of the ideas about acting that came into the method from Stanislavski, which were the idea that acting was, uh, this is a sort of turn of the century idea that acting is sort of sacred, that the actor is a really important um, artist, as important as the playwright or the director, as the sort of the idea of the ensemble, that it isn't just one playwright, but it's a whole group of people together. Um, so there were all these ideas in, in Stanislavski that then entered the method under Lee Strasberg that I thought were ideas that female actors could co-opt. Even if Strasberg or Kazan or others were sexist, they could take those ideas and say, we believe that this character will be thinking this or that, not what you said, and, <laughs> you know, and, and subvert and insert themselves into the, the films or the plays. And then also because the idea that there's a sort of flowing interchangeable relationship between being an actor, being a playwright, being a director, a lot of these women also went on themselves to write, produce and direct. And Jane Fonda is like the crowning example of someone who, who took that empowerment from the method and then started producing feminist films. So Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you, uh, and again, my argument is probably somewhat controversial and still a lot of people think 
the method was bad for women. But Elizabeth, I would love to ask you a little bit about the methodologies and, and ideologies about acting that, you know, shaped, and Lauren, of course, can speak to this too, as the author of a book on Yabby. Like, what are they thinking about acting? Are they reading Stanislavski? Are they reading other acting theorists? So in, in Sarah Allgood's memoir, she doesn't mention, she talks a lot about voice work, but she also, um, one, just seeing Lucy's comment about Kathleen Houlihan, there's a wonderful passage where Sarah Allgood talks about performing Kathleen Houlihan. And she, she says, I'd wanted the part for years. It's painful because the reason she didn't get the part for years is she wasn't like Maud Gunn, you know, six foot tall, statuesque, Anglo-Irish, but she, she got the role. And um, she, she describes such a different Kathleen Houlihan that I'm so interested in because she had performed in, as the mother in Kathleen Houlihan a number of times, the Bridget, the one who loses her son. Um, but she talks about filling herself with joy. Like she talks about being transformed by joy when she's performing this role, um, which I just think is really interesting. Her memoir has a lot of nuts and bolts information about how to get your voice to carry from a stage out. Um, she also talks about modeling characters. So she modeled a lot of characters on her grandmothers. She lived in a multi-generational household. So I'm obsessed with these grandmothers and I've been like all over ancestry.com trying to find out more about them. They are from Limerick um, and at Singh and Yates's suggestion and just on their own ideas, the All Good Sisters filched all kinds of clothing that belonged to their grandmothers to bring to the Abbey stage for the more rural representations. Cause you know, they were playing these like rural characters even though they were from Tenement Dublin really. So they would filch expressions like verbal expressions and actual clothing from their grandmothers and try to act like their grandmothers. There's also kind of like a throwaway line in Sarah Allgood's memoirs. Many of us, I mean, I'm just learning more about Ellen Bushnell or Nellie Bushnell as she's known, who was an Abbey usher who was really involved in 1916. I know Lucy knows a lot about her. Um, but there's a line where Sarah Allgood says, when she's talking about the cabbages and kings, she says, you know, most of my family was at the Abbey, like most of her siblings got jobs at the Abbey. And she says, and place of honor to Nellie Bushnell, that rescuer of Dublin babies. I think I modeled my Juno on her. And I'm reading this in the Berg and I was just like, wow, that's, that's a book right there. You know, these women that she observed and kind of mimicked. And then as they got older, these women lost children, husbands, their brother died in World War I. Um, and you see in the films that they did how they began to embody a certain kind of tragedy that comes from the Abbey, but that's informed as, as they get older. And then the last thing I'll say is um, I started working on Sarah Allgood in film because I was up late watching uh, Turner Classic Movies when my older son was a baby and she just kept showing up. Um, and so she's playing these kind of throwaway, like these bit parts as a maid in like Spiral Staircase. And she has a bigger part in How Green Was My Valley. But you see this Abbey stare, like this very Abbey theater way of performing. That's not just Abbey theater, that's from Nina Heron and the Tableau movement before. Um, physically on um, in these films. So that was really exciting to me. So I don't know as much about method acting at all. Like you're the expert on that, Carrie, but I don't know if that's helpful, just how they spoke about their own performance. Yeah, that's great. That's really, so um, I've got a couple of questions that came to me. So I, I think I should probably answer them. Um, thank you all. Um, I, I've sort of deliberately not spoken a lot about my book because I wanted to showcase these much, much newer books. Um, but I, I did publish a book on Irish writers and the BBC um, where I was really interested in developments in radio broadcasting and how they influence Irish literature. So one of the things that's coming up in this conversation um, that I think I started as writing a book about a medium, about radio, and I really ended up writing a book about an institution and about very much about collaboration. Because um, one thing that I learned writing about radio is just how intensely collaborative it is. Um, so even looking at Yates's broadcasts, um, Yates went in with very definite theories about how he wanted to do radio. And it was really collaborate. It was actually, he tried to do it his own way and it sounded terrible. <laughs> and he was very disappointed with how it sounded. And um, it was like a travesty. Um, he had all his Ab Abbey Theater players. He was doing all his tricks and it didn't work. So it was really his collaboration with George Barnes at the BBC that 
pushed him to adopt a different style for radio, one that was more intimate, more plain spoken, um, a little bit, a little bit less of the oratorical style that he was so enamored by. So um, I absolutely see radio as having an influence on style, but I, I think as I've studied it longer, it's it's very much about it's about the medium, but it's also about the relationships. It's about listening to producers. It's about working with actors. Um, and drawing on a different set of expect expertise. Um, so when I think about radio style, I actually kind of think about two different versions. One is a very plain spoken style um, with a lot of folk influences. And that's one that RTE in particular really developed and Frank O'Connor was, um, was instrumental in that, that um, very folk influenced um, plain spoken version and that the BBC was developing in the talks department. And then the other version is a much more sort of high modernist um, style that Neil Verma describes as kaleidosonic. It's like a mishmash of all kinds of different voices and time shifts and place shifts. And it's very experimental. And that was the work that BBC was developing in the features department. So you see actually different groups developing different kinds of radio styles. Um, and that was one of the things that fascinated me. So that's that's my little my little contribution. One of the things you do so beautifully in your book, Emily, is recover what is not necessarily like in the archive physically, because some recordings exist, but mm -hmm. lots of your research yeah, exactly has disappeared. And so what you've done and what Elizabeth and Carrie and I have also been challenged to do is really an act of historical imagination in, way, in getting ourselves back into these moments and translating these collaborations into something that can be represented materially in a way. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's also fueling this question about, about actresses, but also just about what happens when poets are sitting together in Italy, you know, drinking black coffee, like what's happening in these in these spaces that aren't being recorded in the historical narrative, but that are so generative in terms of the literature that we're looking at. Yeah. Okay, any any other questions for the audience? I just wanted to say, I was just noticing that when Molly Allgood died, she was recording a BBC play of Sings, Emily. So, and part of that had to do with she could know, you know, she didn't look the way that she needed to look to perform these roles anymore. So there's a way that for her, the little money that she was getting was from those radio performances. That's really powerful. Yeah, I would love, I mean, there's there's so many other projects that I think need to happen. And one is um, voice actors. I mean, they're really the work that actors are doing for radio is, I mean, even more lost than what writers are doing. At least with writers, we have the scripts um, in, in, in the BBC's case. RTE is even harder. A lot of the scripts are lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emily, this reminds me of your work on DV also. Yeah, yeah. so I've I, a couple of people in the audience have heard me talk about DV a lot, Teresa DV. Um, so Nathan, Geraldine, you've, you've heard my, my DV spiel, but Teresa DV um, was a playwright, in, you know, important playwright at the Abbey Theater. Um, and her, she was also deaf. And she did um, predominantly radio during the 1940s. Um, so she actually broadcast without ever hearing a radio program in her life. Um, so that's something that really interested me thinking about, you know, what's what's sort of missing from the record here and her, and I was especially interested in just how she accessed radio, right? Just at a very, at a very practical level, like how did she listen? Um, what resources did she need to marshal? You know, who did she, whose door did she need to bang on uh, to get led into a studio? Um, and those kind of things that, that are very hard to sort of, you know, amass in the historical record. Um, oh, and I see here a question from um, Geraldine about uh, Joseph O'Connor's ghost light. Yes, very relevant to this conversation. Is that something either Elizabeth or Carrie or, or Lauren um, have read or thought about in their well, work? Geraldine and I, and Geraldine's been a major part of all of my work, but she and I were at a Zoom, you know, one of the nice, the, the few silver linings of the this horrible time has been getting to 
through Zooms with people who are far away. Um, so Geraldine and I were attending a lot of these talks and we saw Joseph O'Connor, O'Connor speak about Ghostlight, um, which is a fictional ver a, a novel about the relationship between Molly Allgood and J.M. Singh. And I asked, um, you know, where how he got her voice. So he got her voice really, to me, it sounded very similar to the few, so all of her letters were destroyed, probably by saying, probably for gendered reasons, that makes sense. Like she was definitely uh, someone who wrote what were then scandalous things, still kind of are in her letters, you can tell from his responses. So I understand like there's there's gendered structural reasons why her letters got destroyed. Um, but we were talking about this and um, I asked Joseph O'Connor, so how did you get her voice so right? And he said, I'm looking at aunts of mine on this call. He said, um, I just remembered my aunties. Like I remembered how my aunts and my great aunts and my grandmothers spoke. So that's another, you know, that's another piece of collaboration here that, that I think is interesting. That's wonderful. Um, I, I see we are at the 11 um, and I promised that we were going to stop exactly at 11. So I, I hate to, to cut it off so abruptly, but um, this has really been great. Uh, Ghostlight is a good note to end on because I feel like these spectral presences on Zoom um, are with us today. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I just want to congratulate our, our authors today on these terrific books. Um, let's do a round of applause for these, these wonderful books, wonderful contributions to the discussion. And I hope you all get a chance to, to read them. You will not be disappointed. Um, so thank you all for coming today.